Hi, my name is um, Stephen, and I'm from Just Turnings. And today I'm going to talk about uh, equipment as an intro introduction for kitless and bespoke pen making. Um, so I'll be making a series of videos um, for how to make a kitless pen. And today I'll start by talking about the different bits of equipment that you'll need. So first of all, the two bits of equipment that you probably already have um, if you're a pen, pen maker is a Jacob's Chuck to hold drill bits for your tailstock and a live center. Um, so these are just pretty standard pieces of equipment. So a live center, as long as you've got a 60 degree live center, it's good quality, that's all you need. Uh, next, you'll need a collet chuck. So these go into your headstock to hold uh, pieces of round material. So they work by having different size collets, um, which can hold round material. Um, so they'll usually come with a few different ones in uh, millimeter increments. Um, so you'll need one or a couple to hold different size materials, and then another one that um, will hold your mandrels. So they need to match that size. So they work by tightening the nut like this, and that gradually clamps down and makes the um, internal dimension smaller. Um, so this is an ER32, um, which means that the collets can go up to 20 millimeter in diameter. So that's the, the dimension there. So that's the um, sort of typical size. Generally, your mandrels will be about 15 millimeters and your material will be anywhere from 15 through to 20 millimeters. So you don't really need anything bigger than that or too much smaller. Um, so next you'll need a, um, the taps and dies. So the different taps and dies I use, so first of all is the M13 by 0.8 triple start. So it comes as a pair. Um, so this is used to do the external threads on the barrel and the internal threads for the cap there so that it goes on. So the um, die cuts the um, external threads here. So it's triple start, so that means that each, so it cuts three different sets of threads, and so each twist of the cap means it advances three times as far as a single start one, which means that you can put a cap on with only sort of one and a half, two twists, um, whereas a triple start one, that would have taken, you know, three to four twists, which is, you know, just too long. The next one you'll need is something for the nib section to go in there. So this is for the external threads there. So I use a M10 by 0.75. Uh, it's also common to use an M10 by one, um, but I use an M10 by 0.75. Um, so this will create the external threads here, as well as the internal threads on the inside of the barrel there for that to go on. And last one that you'll need is a one specific for your um, nib section for your nib housing, sorry. So you need to create the threads on the for this. Um, so it needs to be created on the inside of here. So I primarily use uh, Joao number six nibs. So I have this one, which is specific to that. So it's an M7.5 by 0.5. So that will create on the inside here, the, um, the threads to hold that. If you're using box um, or a different size Joao as a box, there'll be different um, size taps for each one. Um, which you'll have to get. Then you'll also need um, some mandrels. So these are my custom made mandrels. The threads on here match the threads for the different sections that we use to cre create it. So you'll need three, one for each piece that we're making. So first of all it's a barrel. So that will hold in the collet chuck like that. The, the piece of material so that you can uh, shape it and do the end bit without having something to have to hold it there because obviously it's a um, closed off end. Um, so my one has the M10 by 0.75, which matches the inside there. Then you'll need for the cap. So again, matches the internal threads there. So it's the M13 by 0.8 triple start. Um, it has the sort of a length of the shaft down here, which matches the internal dimensions there to hold it nice and stable for when you're turning to give you a, something solid to work off. So again, it will hold it like that. 
so that you can work on the ends and create that. And lastly is for the nib section. So it's got the internal threads here, which will thread on there like this and then hold it in the thing so you can um, work on it. Um, it's not strictly needed. There are ways to get around having to use this one, um, but this is definitely the, the easier way of doing it. Um, so these are obviously custom made. Um, there are a couple of websites in the UK and US that sell these. Um, obviously you're limited to the threads that they sell them in. So if you're looking to work with something different, then you'll have to get it custom made. Uh, there's no websites in Australia just selling these off the shelf. Um, so you would need to get them custom made. I get these custom made by uh, someone with a metal lathe, um, but any metal worker with a metal lathe that knows what they're doing should be able to make these for you with the correct specifications. So they're fairly simple in, in specifications and diameter. Uh, you can make yourself some quite easily actually, some temporary ones. So I make them out of Evernight. So if I'm trialing something new, I'll make a temporary one. Um, so you can sort of use these for maybe five, 10 pens before they really start bending and losing their shape and not being any good. But if you just wanted to try something out without having to order a whole new one, then you can whip one of these up with a piece of ebonite or good acrylic or something. Um, something that's quite sturdy and easy to work with. Um, I wouldn't do it with a, you know, luminite resin or epoxy like that. Some other things you'll need, um, not 100% necessary, but very helpful are some starter, uh, drill bits. Um, so these you get a set of five, but you really only need these three, um, off of eBay for like $10 or so, quite handy. They, um, help for making, drilling your initial hole. Um, the good thing about them is that the angle here is 60 degrees, so which matches your life center. So it makes it easier for holding your work. And then I also have a carbide barrel trimmer. So I use this for squaring up the ends of material before I start working with it. Um, I find it just works quite easy. You can obviously also do that with a parting tool or some other method. And you also need quite a lot of drill bits. So I use this 29 piece set. Um, you use you know, a lot of these, plus I've got all other random drill bits, but you'll need a lot of drill bits, more than you ever realize. And of course, some turning tools. So I do everything with three. So I do all my main turning with my Thompson um, half inch skew with my custom made barrel from my, from my mate Barry, thank you. Um, and then two parting tools for turning tenons. So um, the turning tool you use is obviously not really important, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, I love my skew, so that's what I use on 99% of it. Um, so you need something that can make the tenons. So basically make a flat sort of section here. So parting tools I find work best. Um, so I use two, most of it I do with this, but there are a couple of like tiny little recesses that you'll need to do just in here, which is too narrow for that. So you need a thin parting tool um, or a very thin carbide parting tool that might be able to do that. But sort of something that you can't get with a round edge parting tool or one of the uh, round edge carbides or things like that. So you really sort of do need a parting tool, especially the thin one. You could probably get away with just one parting tool and doing everything on there, but obviously it's more efficient to use the wider one. And last of all, one of the most important pieces is a decent set of calipers. Um, so I use these digital ones, everything you need to measure, everything needs to be fairly exact. Um, you know, my tenons, I need, to, you know, some of them down to 0.01 of a a uh, millimeter I need to be accurate to a 0.05 sort of thing. So um, I use this at almost every single part. Um, so you can obviously use analog ones if that's what you prefer, but even just the $25 sort of set will do the job um, as long as it's giving you good repeatable results. And the last thing that you'll need is a sliding, rotating, uh, die holder. So this works by holding the dies in here um, So that way that you can cut the external threads on the thing by having that held in your tailstock uh, It's important that it rotates freely otherwise it won't really work um, the Taps can also be held in this thing by some sort of attachment, but it's very fiddly having to remove this and put the other attachment on so I hold these in my Jacob's truck and then I just sort of have it sat very loosely in my tailstock and that provides a 
a straight section for it. So today I'll do three different videos um, after this introduction um, on how to make kitless pens. So as you can see there are three different parts we need to make. So the barrel, nib section and the cap. So today I'll be working with some diamond cast oil slick. So that's one of my favorite resins. Um, reason I chose this is I have a lot of it and it was actually the very first resin or rod that I used to make my very first kitless pen or complete kitless pen. So we'll do that today. So first thing I do is mark out on here the different sections that I need to cut. So I generally need about 95 millimeters uh, for the barrel, uh, about 35 millimeters for the nib section and 65 to 70 for the cap. So you always will need to make it just a little bit bigger than what you're actually making um, because your live center will stick in the end and make a hole which you'll need to turn away and then you also need to square up the ends um, and plus also you know polish it and stuff so you lose a bit of material there and then obviously the um, the width of your saw blade cutting it. Um, so you need to mark it with a sort of line as well so that your um, keeping everything orientated. So you want the pen piece of resin to run in a continuous direction up the pen um, so that it sort of all matches and flows. Um, some resins, this isn't particularly important, um, but others, you know, will be. You'll never get a complete 100% match because things are threading inside there, but you sort of, you know, get the gist of it that way. Okay, so we'll cut up now on the bandsaw. Um, so I've got my three parts. So I've got my barrel, nib section, and cap. Um, so I've kept everything all lined up. Uh, my bandsaw doesn't particularly doesn't do a particularly good job with straight cuts, so always need to make sure we flush it up on the lathe. Make sure it's all nice and even and smooth. Um, if you don't do that, even if it's a very square cut, um, you'll still notice it. So even if you think it's square, you still need to square it up on the lathe make sure. Um, so I'll be starting with the barrel first um, and then I'll do a nib section and then the cap and so the nib section will be for a gyro number six and I'll hopefully in this future series um, do a bock number six as well. Um, so I'll continue these on in a separate video, one for each part. Um, one other point to mention is that would Wood turning is inherently quite dangerous, um, so your safety is your priority and your responsibility. Um, please don't necessarily follow my safety instructions. I'm doing what's safe for me, so you've got to make sure that um, you're following safe procedures for your workshop, and it's your responsibility to do that. Um, this is not an instructional wood turning video on how to use skews and things like that. Um, you need to go elsewhere for that sort of information, and preferably for hands-on advice. Um, I will use wear safety glasses whenever turning um, and I would normally wear a face mask for dust protection um, but I won't sort of during these videos just purely because I'll be talking to the camera um, but I would almost I would always do that and I have a full face mask which um, I use from time to time depending on the material um, but again I won't use that in these videos um, purely just so that I can talk easier with the camera. 